the voices. It's remarkable. The mental picture that came to mind was from Christmas Eve, where we are just holding the candles. And what a difference it makes if as many folks as can be gathered each hold their own candle and it provi provides light not just for them but for their neighbors as well. Thank you for being a part of this community of faith. It matters to help one another in that journey. When we lived in Deland, uh, we um, bought a home that was on a double lot that had had a gardener decades before that loved it. And then it had had a long season of neglect. Benign neglect or otherwise is still neglect. So we had, um, shall we say, an opportunity and, and really enjoyed figuring out what would go where. And every so often I would go to the nursery with a sense of I want a plant that's going to go in an almost shady corner. And I would just wander and see what caught my fancy that was going to grow to be approximately the right size. And at Pell's Nursery in Deltona, there was a lot to choose from. So one day I came home with this starburst clarodendron, or shooting star clarodendron, or any number of other names if you Google it. Uh, but it, it was um, a plant that was going to grow to be 12 or 15 feet tall. It was maybe yeah, about this tall uh, when we brought it home. Big purple blossoms that had like a hundred or more little bitty blossoms in it. It was just beautiful. Dark leaves, slightly fuzzy burgundy on the underside. Whether it was bloom or blooming or not, it was going to be gorgeous. So we dug the hole, proper size, watered thoroughly, all that kind of stuff. It was in bloom, and it just looked gorgeous the whole bloom season. And then the blooms fell off. We were headed into summer, didn't think much of it, and then the leaves fell off. And I am thinking to myself, this is not supposed to be a leaf-dropping deciduous shrub. It should hold its leaves. So I started inquiring of others who knew a little more about this plant and our location, and they said, it probably got transplant shock. That's when it just doesn't make the move well, its roots aren't really settled in enough, and then when the tough times come, it'll sacrifice the leaves so that the roots can get established. Don't worry, keep watering it, it'll come back. And I looked at that scrawny, scraggly silhouette, and then after a while, the leaves came back. Transplant shock. Because the roots don't get sufficiently settled and watered and just can't make it when it gets to be a difficult season. It's a good image for today's scripture. Psalm 1 is really kind of the preface and introduction to the whole book of Psalms. Really Psalm 1 and 2 each introduce, each introduces a critical theme that will get unfolded and redeveloped throughout the whole rest of the book. Psalm 1 starts with happy, blessed. Happy are those who, happy is the one who, and then begins to say this is what it means to walk in the way that leads to true blessedness. Psalm 2 introduces the theme that God is indeed king over all, and together those two themes will be woven throughout every other part of this book. It's a song book, really, in the same way that y'all have a collection of the songs and you can rearrange their order. And it eventually got arranged in this way. So Psalm 1 had an independent use, we presume, at some point, and then became used as the kickoff psalm, if you will, for the whole collection. And it draws this amazing image between those who choose to follow God and those who don't. Of course, it starts by saying, well, the person who is blessed is not this, does not do that, certainly doesn't do the other. 
but finally, this is what it is. So it sort of lays it out by, don't go here, don't go there, don't do that. Interesting collection. The truly happy do not follow wicked advice. You'd think that'd be self-evident, but it's not always. That's why we teach the children and grown-ups about the importance of making good choices rather than poor choices. We try and tell the children that it's simple. We discover as we age, it's not always as clear cut as you think, but the truly happy do not follow wicked advice. They do not stand on the road of sinners. In other words, they don't go hang around with the folks who are headed in a pretty clearly bad direction. And they do not sit with the scoffers. Now, scoffers is a word that probably I could ask, has anybody used this word in the last week? Nobody would raise, well, someone would raise their hand. I hope you were not tattling on someone else, but perhaps. Uh, the word, I'm trying to think of a contemporary equivalent, because disrespectful just sounds a little too elegant for scoffer. Well, the contemporary equivalent would probably be snarky. It's that sense of, sullen disrespect and arrogant you can't make me and who made you or the boss of me anyway it's that sense of I'm just going to pick and punch and um, ridicule and distance myself from good advice well the truly happy don't do those things they don't hang out with the wicked they don't go stand around on the side of the road with the sinners and they do not as Eugene Peterson says they do not go to smart mouth university they don't go there. Instead, what they do is to delight in God's instruction. They meditate on it. They chew on it. They'll talk to themselves about it. They'll mumble. and I mean, they, they will rehearse it in their minds and hearts all the time. They contemplate on it. They ruminate on it. It sinks in and soaks in and surrounds them. And there's something about that that transplants them. Now, I will say that here we run into the limits of the image of being like a tree planted by the water who will not be moved. Because trees don't transplant themselves. Except in the Ents, in the Lord of the Rings, trees don't move from, oh, this is not a good place, I'm going to go over there. Someone moves a tree from one place to another. And if that's not possible, redirects the water so that the tree will thrive. And the focus here is on that stable, solid rootedness. And out of that comes the leaves and the fruit in season. But the focus here is the roots in God's law, God's instruction, God's word. The same image is used in Jeremiah 17 with the, the tree and the, the fruit, although there the fruit uh, seem to happen all the year rather than just in season. And there it says that the leaves are not anxious in time of drought. The leaves don't get anxious. People get anxious. But the image reminds us that like that sable-rooted tree, we will not wither and wilt and dry up in a difficult time if we are rooted in God. Now the contrast with that is chaff. Chaff. Now again, it's not a really agricultural group, although when we've used chaff in another sermon, uh, it was in a gospel reading sometime last year, several folks came up and told me how dangerous it was if you get too much chaff in one place. It, it, can, it is quite literally very flammable. It's also lightweight, so that when you threw the grain into the air, the, the uh, grain, the good grain, would settle because it's heavier, and the chaff literally blowing in the wind and just gone. The image for the trees um, takes several verses. It's pretty fully developed. And, it, and instead, the psalmist says the wicked, well, they're like dandelion fluff. They're that insubstantial. Now, I will say that wicked 
seems kind of like a drastic, dramatic term for those who would rather not be instructed in God's word. It just seems to be a little bit of overkill, except that in the choice to not pay attention to God's direction is the choosing of a direction that will eventually lead to death. And the psalmist describes it perhaps as perishing, or describes it absolutely as perishing, and you can look at it as, you know, is that an arbitrary punishment? No. That is the natural consequence of the choice to go away from God rather than toward God. Now God, on the other hand, keeps inviting us back. It's sort of the theme throughout all of the Old and New Testament to invite us to choose the life-giving path. Now, sometimes that means honoring the boundaries that God has set. You can eat anything in the garden except that one. Oh, and the one right next to it. Don't eat from those. Well, immediately, of course, which tree has the most attractive fruit? But the choice was there. And over and over again, Moses and others invite the people of God to choose. God offers the covenant. Will we choose to enter into it? God offers a path that leads to life. Will we choose to follow it? And really, the whole of Scripture is the long unfolding story of God creating us, designing us to choose to be in relationship with God, and us persistently, willfully, and repetitively choosing, nope, we'd rather do it ourselves. Because that's really the essence of someone who will be um, contrasting here, the uh, obedience to God's word. That's to say, God knows better than I do, and I'm going to learn and be instructed. Contrast that with, nope, I will decide it for myself. I will be autonomous. The word root for that has to do with being a law unto oneself. Nobody else can make my rules. I'm going to do what I want, and never mind the consequences. Except they're deadly. And over and over again, God keeps inviting us to choose life again and again. The truly happy and blessed person is the one who understands that in the long run, we're dependent on God. We didn't get here of our own intentionality and we will not sustain our life. We will not um, find our life on our own. It comes from, is grounded in, and leads to God. The truly happy and blessed life is God-centered and God-rooted. And contrast that with what unfortunately is too much of the American way of life, of I will do it myself, I'll be self-sufficient, you can't tell me what I can't do. I'll do whatever I want and never mind the consequences. And that sense of being not open to wisdom is the choice that is described as wicked. Not necessarily because it's mean, although it can lead to that, but because it just chooses to turn away from God. Interesting that this call to choose between life or death, between being rooted and grounded in God or being on our own, sounds an awful lot like Jesus' invitation to repent and join the kingdom of God to turn from our own intentions to live under the sovereignty of God rather than being a law unto ourselves. And over and over again, Jesus uses images that teach this. The the parable of the sower who went and sowed the seed and some seed didn't even have a chance to grow roots, other grew roots, but they were shallow. And some grew and really took root. And those were fruit. Or the mustard seed 
little bitty seed, but oh, when it was rooted in good soil and flourished, then it became a place of hospitality and safety for so many. Over and over, Jesus talks about a fruitful harvest. And the theme is those who accept and do what he teaches will experience that fruitfulness. Those who do not hear it will find themselves removed, pruned, cut off, and withered. It's a tough thing. I found myself, uh, uh, well, let's see, two things. Here, every so often, my English lit major just sort of comes bubbling up unexpectedly. So, so today you get Flannery O'Connor and Robert Frost. Um, the Flannery O'Connor character was a fella whose name was Misfit. And when asked why he didn't pray, his response was, I don't want no help. I'm doing all right by myself. Except he wasn't. But he would rather wither and diminish, refusing any help, than admit that he was not self-sufficient. And then on this uh, element of choosing, uh, two roads diverged in the yellow wood. Some of you probably memorized it in sixth or seventh grade. And there's that sense of, of I took the road less traveled. But if you go back and read the poem carefully, at the point of decision, the paths looked fairly similar, and you couldn't tell where they went. This choice is not like that. The paths are not similar, and they do not have the same results. The choice to be rooted and grounded in God has life-giving results, and the choice to not do that is deadly, quite deadly. Now the fact that you came today, to me says, I mean, you chose to vote with your feet and come and be a part of worship. So there is some sense of, these are not equal choices. I think maybe I will go gather with others who are wanting to be God's people and be reinforced in that. So for us, and if you've not made the choice to turn Godward, this would be as good a morning as any and perhaps better than any other because it's the one we've got, uh, to choose that. For those who have chosen that, what's the next step? Not just to look way down the road and say, yeah, I want to be the green leafy tree. I don't want to be dandelion fluff. But what's the next step? Now for some... The very basic choice is find a Bible that's readable for you. That's why we give pretty simple ones with explanatory notes to the children and then teach them what those numbers mean and how to find their way around in some pretty unfamiliar territory. You know, nobody is born knowing how to use it. But find one that brings you a sense of encouragement and that you will actually read. The best translation is the one you use. It's a good idea to have several because, frankly, translations are um, fascinating critters, but that's a whole different story. Uh, <clears throat> find a Bible that is readable. Choose a time and a place. If you just depend every day on, well, will I feel like it or not, just gu I'll guarantee you, you won't have the time and you won't make the space in your life. It just won't happen. So choose and, and be forgiving with yourself about experimenting. Some seasons in life, it may mean staying up a little bit later. Other seasons, it may mean getting up a little earlier. Sometimes, I've been in places where I could pull my Bible out at lunchtime. These days, it can look like you're reading on your phone. And you could be reading on your phone and reading scripture. Some folks get an audio version. Figure if they're going to commute 45 minutes, might as well be a little more firmly grounded in scripture. I knew a woman in uh, Tallahassee, I've probably told you about her, because I just so admired her creativity. She was the mother, I think, of triplets. Maybe it was only twins. I had, was not a mother yet at that point, so it all looked very daunting to me. She hired a babysitter to babysit the kids so she could go to Publix. She decided that it was an investment in her well-being to pay the babysitter for an extra hour. And she'd drive to Publix and park in the shade 
keep the car running if it was too hot to just roll the windows down. And she would do her disciple Bible study daily readings, most at one swoop, because she knew that otherwise once she got home, it was going to be really hard. And she wanted to prioritize it. So choose and, and just experiment. Find what works for you. Don't beat yourself up if one method doesn't. Find another. For many folks, finding a group, whether that is a Sunday school class. I've been flabbergasted that Monday afternoon turns out to be a good time for folks to come and study scripture. Who would have thunk? Or Thursday lunch. Or there's a bunch in people's homes in the afternoons and evening. Find a group to help you because frankly, some of it's pretty unfamiliar territory. And it helps to travel that with others. The question really is to to dive into it in some way. If you've studied it a lot, perhaps this is a season to sing it or pray it, to absorb it rather than just, just know more details about it. But if you don't know the basic contours of it, you gotta know that too. You can't interpret it and apply it until you know enough about the flow of it. Memorize it. Memorize it. That way you're not dependent on is your phone charged or did you bring a Bible with you. Folks who have spent time in solitary confinement or in jails or prisoners of war have said that the scripture that they memorized is what got them through very often. Marinate in it quite literally. That'd be the human version of the roots in the water so that you can absorb it and have it fill you. One of the things I've been doing since I knew we were going to be reading Psalms, I had a book on my shelf that a friend had given me an embarrassingly long time ago. Every so often I would pick it up, but I, not with any real regularity until I knew we would be uh, spending time with the Psalms. And they are Psalms, they're a modern paraphrase, not an exact translation, written from the perspective that the most fundamental truth about God is God's love. Why else would a parent teach a child if not for love? Why else would God give us scriptures and prophets if not for love? And so here is Psalm 1. The book is called Psalms for Praying. Blessed are those who walk hand in hand with goodness, who stand beside virtue, who sit in the seat of truth. For their delight is in the spirit of love, and in love's heart they dwell day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water that yield fruit in due season and their leaves flourish. And in all that they do, they give life. The unloving are not so. They are like dandelions which the wind blows away. Turning from the heart of love, they will know suffering and pain. They will be isolated from wisdom, for love knows the way of truth, and the way of ignorance will perish. Blessed indeed are those whose lives are grounded in God's word. Let us go to the Lord in prayer.